asked me to go out into the hall. I went out into the hall. She asked me to go farther, not just down the hall, but to the other side of the trauma ward, where the bank of windows faced west, and where, during the third dressing change, I sat in the chair by the elevator and tried to my persuade myself that the setting sun felt good on my skin, was warming me. But really, I was plotting how to cheat, to sneak back on her side of the hospital, not only on her side, but next to her door, not only next to, but inside the door, to be inside and with her when the nurse drew the gray curtains, when the flowers on the sill were trapped between window and cloth, pressed up against the glass like some embalmed specimen. I felt the same crease of cool air slicing her in half, turning over onto her stomach, the thin gown sliding open and back, the spine, the cleaving calves, we are two halves. And I watched the nurse placing white gauze in a stack, counted the morphine drips, tried to find some sort of rhythm in it all, some sort of pattern, <coughs> the way her skin would later be, meshed by making lengthwise nicks in succession, stippled like the pincushion of a seamstress who kept her needles meticulous in rows down and across in the cushion's flesh. And all of this to be torn apart. Yes, to at least hear her scream, to hold her hand, her head even, while the nurse again ripped the bandage off in order to keep the wound fresh, keep it fertile for grafting. But she had asked me to go out into the hall. I sat in the chair on the west side of the building and pretended to find patience and warmth while she screamed over there, screamed because there was nothing left to try, no anodyne that would be strong enough. And she asked me to go out into the hall, and she screamed because it was wrong, and she wouldn't say that it was wrong, and she wouldn't let me see so that I might say that it was wrong. I sat there with only my careless imagination, a mirror unable to reflect from such a distance, a lung inhaling smoke, that it may be closer to numbness and pain. At this point, turning back will take longer than moving forward. The Lang Tang Valley slips into the trees. Already we have climbed beyond ideas of exhaustion. A dirt path narrows to ten small steps. We take the stairs. Then even the crude ends, a gash of what was stone brought down to dust, a landslide. The path snakes through pale rubble, a faint line like an animal track through grass hinting upward. I stop and look down the long run. Boulders have been put to bed in their own quick chips under a dusty blanket, settled in an even line over sapling, fern, any green once clinging to the mountain now covered in a rush. Ahead, a hiker's red shirt flames and waves as it bobs away. I sway, am swaying, in me a magnet drawn to the valley's core, to the river's channel. I cannot move from the bare sight. On the edge of this moment, the body resists and invites all the water in me wants to plunge to earth. And we take the rise hiking Clifty Falls in Indiana, the first on the path in the morning heat. There are stories forking off. There are stories told over and over. And inchworm threads thread our eyelids and noses and mouths we keep grasping at. An invisible binding binds us makes our bodies tressery with sweat and sticky web collecting forearm, shoulder, chest. There are stories stuck. There are stories that hold like duct tape. And then we go down. And occasional gusts toss black and yellow caterpillars into underbrush, a flat boulder to sit on, some bread and cheese to eat. 
and we watched the stream twist off towards working smokestacks and the Ohio. And there's a sound of industry, a distant motor underneath it all, the minor key of which I am so sedulous a student. And you say, what was it again? There are questions, there are stories about unfair questions that stick in your hair like gum. And you say, what was it about pain? And I tell it how my stepfather would use psychology to keep us going, hiking California's Yalobali wilderness, straps pinching flesh. And he would ask, where do you go with your pain? Our bodies sore and blistered, our sore minds blistering. And he would sit us there and analyze and say, I know what your neurosis is, but I'm not going to tell you. There are stories swallowed, stories like capsule pills, the slow release kind. Where does our pain go? These miles and miles in, the heavy pack I take off, the craggy exposed roots on the way to water. And I stumble without accustomed weight, a lightness that felt even then like floating into ether. As children, we were warned not to whistle at night for fear of evil spirits. Dangerous animals became even more sinister and uncanny in the dark. A snake was never called by its name at night because it would hear. It was called a string. A beetle the size of a child's fist was never pointed out to have pinchers. It was called a button. A spider in the web of its life didn't have poison secreted away, nor the sticky means with which to entrap. It was purely called an apple hanging on a branch. A black bat wasn't fast enough to swoop into anyone's hair, get tangled there. It was called a paper snowflake. It was called a falling leaf. A lizard bent around a branch was a headband you wear to keep hair out of your face. A cricket was simply a clothespin. The bigger animals were nothing more than clothing tossed out. A bear was a worn through winter jacket. A fox, a scarf rubbed down to beaded threads. And that praying mantis stuck up against the wall, only a necklace to adorn your thin collarbones. A scorpion was merely the bent latch from a window. A silverfish is just a drop of coffee. Two cockroaches paused on cement, plainly a pair of sunglasses dropped and forgotten in the hustle of the day. A line of ants, straight stitches on the hem of the tablecloth at which you'll sit in the morning. And what is that roll of toilet paper doing, hooting from the ridge of the roof? And why is the lampshade creeping stealthily through the courtyard and hopping up on the rim of the open garbage can? And how is that small water bottle inching slowly forward, leaving its saliva a trail of where it has been pointing to where it is going? And who scattered those 20 plump baby shoes under the bush? And what makes them chirp and dance around like popcorn in the fryer? They seem to be looking for something so small they can't find it, pecking as they are with their blunt toes. A house is not a house, and you are not inside the house. You are not a body lying in bed, but a bench for something higher to sit down on. If only you could move your wooden legs and stand up, Everything would be over in an This is where I live, at the edge of the plowed field where sunlight catches meadow grasses and turns them silver yellow like the twines of the birches, at the rim of the forest, where lumps of earth are scabbed over with rust-colored pine needles, and one noisy crow has been traversing them all morning. Deep in these woods, his feathers have fallen so often in some places they've started to pile up like black snow. I prefer it here, at the line where the forest intersects the field, where deer and groundhog move back and forth to feed and hide, 
On these juts and outcroppings, I can look both ways, moving as that crow does, all gracelessness and sway across the heaped up fields. Then tricky flight between the overhanging branches he somehow manages never to scrape against. This life is not easy, but wings mix up with leaves here. Like the moment when surf turns into undertow and breaker, and I can poise myself and hold for a long time, profoundly, neither one place nor another. This is going to cost you. If you really want to hear a country fiddle, you have to listen hard. High up in its twang and needle, you can't be running off like this all knotted up with yearning, following some train whistle, can't hang on to anything that way. When you're looking for what's lost, everything's a sign. But you have to stay right up next to the draw and pull of the thing you thought you wanted, had to have it, could not live without it. Honey, you will lose your beauty and your handsome sweetie, this wine, this agitation, the one you sent for with your leather boots and your guitar, the lonesome snag of barbed wire you have wrapped around your heart is cash money, honey. You will have to pay. Driving through the Monongahela Valley in winter is like driving through the gray matter of someone not too bright, but conscientious. <laughs> a hard-working undergraduate who barely passes. Everybody knows how hard he tries. I'm driving up into gray mountains, and there it may be snowing gray. Little flecks like pigeon feathers or what used to sift down onto the now abandoned slag piles, like what seems to sift across the faces of the jobless in the gray afternoons. At Johnstown, I stop, look down the straight line of the incline closed for repairs to the gray heart of steel mills with for sale signs on them. Behind me is the last street of disease-free Dutch elms in America. Below me a city rebuilt three times after flood. Gray is a lesson in the poise of affliction. Disaster by disaster, we learn insouciance, begin to wear colors bright as the red and yellow sashes on elephants, whose gray hides cover like this sky, an enormity none of us can fathom, though we try. I didn't. Only responsible people keep cows. If you buy near cattle, you can count on your neighbors to be home repairing fences. Cows don't know how much they cost or yield, and cats are free. <laughs> I always cried as a child when we drove past the stockyard and had to hear the cattle moaning because crowded not knowing they were going to die. It's still their ignorance that breaks my heart. How elaborately the savings of the desperate poor pile up, old car parts and empty bottles, broken dolls and rusty buckets hung on nails, and always cats who seek the indigent out. As a child, I preferred the littered farms where it seemed to me the accumulation was like art, arranged by some design. And as a child, I'd be hoarse to my friend Patty with her brace and orthopedic shoe. A rope around my waist, I'd gallop easy so Patty could keep up. And we'd run to the hilltop to see all the farms. Once, a bearded woman in overalls and army jackets screamed at us to get away from her collected bounty spreading out from her porch to her unposted fields. She spooked the cattle next to the farm over, and they took off, so their hooves shook the ground where we stood. I took off, too, and Patty tugged my rope, 
but I was wild and strong enough to carry her despite her limp. I was wild and strong enough to carry all of us. I could be a bearded woman on a porch and still have cows and not care how I dressed. I could yell at little girls who pretended to be horses, save everything that ever came to me, all my cats lined up on tidy fences, my cattle never slaughtered for money. <laughs>